I'm John Graft, and I love Chicago real estate. Between showings, I stop in my favorite places, talk with local business owners, and bring their story to you. This is my Chicago. Unless you got like extreme, an, an extreme amount of money to... To burn. Right. Yeah. And then ex exactly, because initially, you gotta go through A-B testing, right? Because now you gotta figure out, okay, what content um, that I make is gonna generate the greatest amount of engagement. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can figure that out is through actual metrics, which means you have to have a, some type of uh, uh, budget to allocate towards just that endeavor. And just then, testing. Just testing. Yeah. So, and that's where it becomes challenging. So then from there, it's like, okay, well then now you're testing for like 90 days. So it's, I hope you got three months. What's the process look like when you're creating an ad what you, is your, your, your A-B testing? You're creating two totally separate ads? Walk me through the process. So initially, um, so for example, we'll start with one. Now, obviously we follow like uh, uh, fundamentals of psychology when it comes to content mm -hmm. consumption. So initially we know that, okay, we have four seconds to uh, have people gravitate towards what we're doing before they go to the next thing. So we initially start off with, okay, what's the attention grabber or what do we want them to see initially? So this last ad that I just did for Desk Cube, for example, um, we focused in on the desk. So now they know what it is that they're seeing. I'm not waiting to, like sometimes people create concepts where it's like, um, it's like a buildup. You won't mm -hmm. have time to build up. No. Nobody cares about the buildup. You, you almost work, you reverse engineer that. You figure out, okay, boom. So we create that and then pertaining to whatever like the brand is or the product is, now it's like, okay, once we show what it is, now what we want to do is we want to paint a pic the picture of how can that person viewing use it in their life. So we show um, like the, the functionality of that product. So you're going straight, showing the product, and then how someone uses the product. Right, so straight to the product. In four seconds. Well, within four to like six seconds. Okay. So product, cool, cool, cool. Now we're moving into how a person would utilize that in real in their real life. And then now we have more room between that and the outro, which is the call to action, to now uh, here are some of the highlights of this product. Here's some uh, UGC type of, you know, user generated content. So that's social proof. Mm -hmm. So now we move into the social proof and then we might address an issue. So that's, that'd be a different ad, but we'll do social proof and then call to action. Then we might do something to where um, let's address an issue. So we'll go into somebody doing something where it's like, oh, that's, that's me. Like, oh damn, like, I have a problem with this particular thing. And then right into the answer. And so you're doing that on ads too, showing the, the what would it be, the rebuttals or the objections someone might have, right. so you're creating the rebuttals on the ads? Right, so you have, now you can test these two things out. Um, now other testing might even be uh, demographic, other testing, it might not be creative, it might be uh, ad spent, it might be uh, geolocation, it might also be ethnicity, right? Um, and so being able to paint that picture when creating that, it's gonna ultimately determine like what those things are. So, you know, what we'll test A, B testing on different ads, you know, um, four different ads simultaneously, A, a B testing these certain things. And then after a certain period of time, we'll have certain metrics. And so we'll, we'll monitor it day by day, see what's happening. And there are times where it's like, this is just doing horrible. Let's just not spend no more media buy because there's gonna be no return on investment. And you losing. already had to create the video to do that. So you have to create all the content and then put it out there and test it. And so much content could just go to the wayside. 100%. Yeah. yeah. So then How that's, much do you usually throw away? Um, I mean, initially, we'll do market research. We'll also um, study, like if we're gonna be in the Facebook ecosystem, we'll go to like um, ads library. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is we'll go through ads library with similar um, businesses or... So the ads library, is that a, a library of ads other people have posted? Yes. And so you can see the success of those? Yes. Like, you, you determine the success as uh, how long it's been up. Okay. Right, because because of, of brands, if, if this ad is doing well, I'm gonna keep it up. Mm -hmm. If it's doing terrible. So you can see the lifeline of it? Yes. Okay. So I can see, okay, this has been up for eight months. It's probably doing well. Yeah. Right. Um, Do they give you any other stats? 
Um, no, okay. no. I mean, you'll get like like views, you can see engagement, stuff like that, but nothing. Okay, that's that's good. Yeah, yeah. So you're able to kind of see what that looks like, and then for me, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. Not when it comes to ads, unless there's a budget for that. Mm -hmm. But when you're trying to be frugal, you you have to utilize market research. That's heavy versus being the research people are looking. You know what I'm saying? For like, it's one thing to be like, okay. We're trying something completely new. We have the budget for it, and we're gonna figure it out through other means, such as A and B testing. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than go through that mistake, we'll go into the market research, figure that out, um, generate those ads, and then do maybe A and B testing on even that, um, and then you know monitor it, monitor that for three to seven days, see what's happening. After those three to seven days, we can get a clear indication at least of what that engagement is slightly looking like. Now, because of the new iOS um, and the, you know, people being able to opt out of ads and not have that information put out there, it's a lot harder now. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're having to um, innovate and, and, and navigate into certain areas. So across the board, unless you have millions of dollars, it's becoming a little bit harder in the Facebook ecosystem to really get people to engage with your ad. So now what that means is it's going to fall back on the creative, right? So it's like, okay, it's a lot harder. So your creative is going to have to be so much more better. Um, but yeah, like, you know, it's, it's a 50, 50, the 50, 50 is how the creative is. And the 50 other side of the 50 is, um, the media buyer, how you strategically put that together. Um, and then how you lay out your campaign, right? So, uh, here, this ad is only being seen by people who've never seen it. Boom. Now we have a follow-up ad that's only being seen by people who've seen the first one, right? So it's, it's, it's simultaneously happening. But now this ad isn't as if you've never seen us before. Now it's more call to, call to action. Okay. Now it's more like, all right. Now that you've already seen the ad, you might have some background information. Now we're trying right. to sell. Right. So we're now, not educating. Exactly. So now it's, it's in your psyche. So now we'll move probably to the educational part of things where it's like, oh, that product's dope. It's great. Now okay, it's like. Okay, so introduce. Edu what, what are the order of operations? Right, so you would definitely introduce, um, if we're talking about the setup of ads in a campaign, so you would probably introduce just to get them aware. It's all about a brand awareness initially, um, and then a call to action. Hopefully, and then hopefully at that point, after they see that, they're engaging. That's the best outcome. Um, if they don't, then we have a follow-up ad. That one... It could be a mixture. It could be edu it could be slightly educational in terms of educating the people why they want that product, or more of like um, how that product can be used, which is a form of education with less direct. I imagine if someone, if, so if someone's looking at the ad, they hit the buy button, they go to the page, but they don't check out, then maybe you have to kind of objection handle after that. Yeah, so right? and yeah. give the potential objections someone might have to bring right. them back to it. Yeah, so you got like abandonment browse. Is what we call it, what is or it? abandonment browse. Like okay. It, right. So after browsing, they abandon, mm -hmm. um, or the abandonment cart. Mm -hmm. So when they abandon, abandonment, like they put the product in the cart, but they, 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 for whatever reason, they didn't purchase. So we have follow ups as of recently. What we do now is the best return um, is SMS marketing now. Okay. So like email marketing, email campaigns, uh, that has decreased in. Um, and the percentage of people actually opening, mm -hmm. SMS marketing has a 97% uh, open rate. Obviously, it's a law of numbers. So because there's an increase in the amount of openings for the SMS marketing, that's going to allow a greater increase of revenue eventually, right? Um, so, and with that, you're directly going to your phone. So um, what we'll do is now. Um, so, so at that stage, to have their phone number, they've clearly filled out some type of form. Yep. So, it's, so if someone goes into the cart, but do they already have to fill out a, a contact page before that to get so, that far? Right. So uh, there's two ways about it. Once you get to that far, uh, get that far in the process on the on the site. Let's say they're browsing the site. Mm -hmm. um, with that, that site automatically captures information. That's why now they you have to put accept cookies, yeah. right? Ultimately, what they're doing is they're exchanging their information, even if they don't know they're exchanging their information. Um, and then we're able to take that and, and direct what we need to direct. Now, 
um, because of the new laws, it's that, that, that's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. So now we need your number. Now we need you to give us your email. So what we're going to do is, um, so what we're doing, but if it was a brand that came, what we would do is um, we would create that pop-up. And then that pop-up would say for $50 off or for 10% off or for 15% off, um, become part of our list, put your number in there. So and, you, you're switching from emails to phone numbers now yes. on that pop-up. Uh -huh. Because pop-ups are huge. No one likes them, but they're on every site because they work. Yes. And so we're getting rid of the, not getting rid of email marketing, mm -hmm. but email marketing opening rate has decreased like exponentially. Um, the younger the audience, less likely they are to open their email. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, if, if you're like more on the beginning of the millennial, you'd probably be in your emails, you know, um, but moving forward, it's just a lot harder. So people who create apps, they have to compete with somebody's phone in saying that they're willing to give up phone real estate for your app. Guess what app they're never getting rid of? The messaging app. Yeah. It's there forever because it's a part of the phone. It's never like, oh, I want to add or take away. It's going to be there. So, and it's like, hey, put, put your number in and we're going to send you a coupon. All right, cool, why not? Boom, now you just opt into the system. Do you think a younger audience has less of a problem with that? Because I remember when people were asking for my number, like, I don't want to give you my number. 100% less of a problem. Yeah. Like, think about it now. Um, uh, SMS marketing, like, the app, uh, the company community, mm -hmm. like, they were ahead of it because they understood the trajectory of what was going on. People are a lot less, people really don't care that you have their information. See, it's it's a psychological thing. Yeah. Like psychologically, I have a barrier up. Like, right. I don't want to give you anything. Right. Exactly. And that's because you also have an understanding of the branding and marketing side. Yeah. So you already have your your reservations. You know. Yeah. Um, and that's hard because you get tunnel vision with that. And it's hard to look through a new a new viewpoint sometimes and have a different perspective because you're like, no, I, I would never do it. Like, yeah, but everyone else is. Right. Yeah. And, and forget and what you think you know. Exactly. Because the that's the hardest part of right. all of this. The exception doesn't make the rule. The majority does. Yeah. And that's so good. that's real good. Yeah. yeah. So the, since we know the majority is that's what we follow suit for because we're, we're trying to tap into that. And so they'll put their number in and then we have an automated system. That automated system, now that they've done that, they're going to get their code instantly. This now they're locked in. And in there, we have, we've created automated systems in a flow. So after 20 minutes, if no purchase happened, two options. So after 20 minutes, there's two uh, outcomes. Either one, they purchased, or two, they didn't, so it goes to this side. Then it's gonna put, hey, um, we see that you, you know, you left something in your cart. Don't forget to come get it back. Yeah. Like just different things like that, and it's directly into their phone. So are you guys using Twilio to send those out? Mm -hmm. Like a similar system? Uh, we use Attentive. Attentive? Yeah, so. Does Attentive also have the brackets and the different funnels and how it's moving yeah. forward? So you can build that there. And then when you're using that, so that's not just SMS, I imagine? Um, well, I mean, it's just SMS. Uh, we integrate it with uh, Klaviyo, which is our email marketing. Mm -hmm. They definitely integrate and they integrate with our Shopify um, as well. Um, Do you guys run the desk view on Shopify? Yes. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Shopify is just a great tool and just even in the back office being able to see all the metrics, oh, all the sales. It's very easy. Super I, convenient. I, I do nothing on e-commerce, but I've messed around with it just because Shopify is Shopify. Yeah. I'm like this is, I mean, it's like what WordPress did for the internet and websites almost. So like we did, we did this for shopping for e-commerce. Right. E-commerce, Shopify. I remember when they just came out too, it was crazy. But yeah, Shopify went from this to like whew, every, yeah. most most e-commerce websites are like Shopify mm -hmm. um, and you never know what it is and just being able, their, their ability to um, integrate, their integrations are what makes them so much more convenient because okay. you can have all these different softwares and all these different things and they already have partnerships with them. So it's tying with everything, very easy, like APIs? APIs, yeah. um, your APIs, your integration widgets, yeah. um, apps, which is widgets, um, it's just so much, more, it's smooth. So like, that's why I've been with Attentive. Uh, Attentive is exactly that. They're like the number one actually SMS uh, mar marketing software company right now. Like everybody uses them. Um, and their their stats are fucking amazing. So, but they have a much, uh, very user friendly interface. Yeah, it's very, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's actually very similar to, um, the flow of Shopify, okay. where on the left side you have what it is you need, and then it brings up to the right. Like it's very. That's what every everything that comes out today. It's, you can always tell they're like, okay, we built this. Like you look at Slack or you look at all these different things. You're like, okay, so that was the idea. 
Like you have this modular, this template that you're used to, so let's use what people are already using. Let's make it just, just like that. And that way people can navigate it so much better. Right, so think about it. The reason why it's because you have these companies who spend millions of dollars actually doing case studies, um, getting people in and saying, hey, we have these 10 different websites and you have a thousand people coming in and getting paid just to give their opinion about what website flows better, mm -hmm. what website wanted me to purchase quicker, what, how, is there less touch points, how's the flow of the website, and that's with anything. And so all this money is being spent into understanding the psychology behind a purchase, a, a purchase or a person's actions on something why would I want to create anything different unless I really know that this is something that's going to do that? No, forget that. I'm just going to continue to do exactly yeah. what this company has spent millions of dollars to do, yeah. which I don't have They're to do that. It. Right. They're testing it. Like it's really happening. So, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's part of market research as well. That's some of the things that we recognize. So when we see a particular brand doing a certain ad, I know that it wasn't by accident. They have a whole process of understanding and, and a whole department of hundreds of people saying, no guys, this is what we need to do. Those meetings, you got people in there who are getting paid six, seven figures a year just to have that conversation. Yeah. Of course, I'm just gonna be like, okay, you did the work for me. So let me figure out uh, um, how cohesive that is with all the other brands and do they follow a particular like objective? And for me, it's like, all right, then that's what we wanna follow, right? Then when we get into the place where our dominance in a space and cr creates the influence, now I can start to mess around with other things because I've created brand loyalty. So now my customers are loyal to me and they're down no matter what. That's like when every platform does a new feature and people complain at first, but it becomes the norm. Right, like yeah. Reels, yeah. like IGTV. Right. Well, like, Facebook was, you know, Facebook was Facebook and then they did the news feed. Everyone was like, well, this is creepy. creepy. Right. Well, well, what would Facebook be without a news feed today? Right, and, and the thing about it is is that's the realization that Facebook understood was we we know you more than you know yourself. Yeah, that's true. In terms of your brain, like because everybody everybody thinks they're the exception, but there are certain things in a human being that is across the board. That's just the facts. You have a brain like me, and there are certain functionalities within your brain, and there are certain things that when they're triggered create this, that release particular chemicals, it's, you're not different. You're not a, you're not a fucking alien. You're, you, ever, you ever notice, anytime you open up Instagram, it'll always show you how many hearts, messages, whatever you have, even if you've already seen them, because they want to make you feel good. Right, oh they're, yeah. They're like, let's, let's, let's drop a little dopamine in your day. 100%. Here it, it is. Social media is dopamine. Yeah. It's literally like the excessive amount of dopamine. You know, even myself, I'm like, I gotta catch myself. I'm like, all right, get off it. It's not. I, I get zero alerts. I don't have it on the front page, and I check in strategically a couple times a day, but I do not sit there. But then all of a sudden, 15 minutes go by, you're like, what did I just do with my life? It's about intentionality. And so for me, I, I've become a lot more aware. It's not perfect, but while I'm doing it, I'm like, okay, well, why am I doing this right now? Like, I get into that space where I always ask myself, why am I doing something? Because I feel when you're aware of the intentionality behind what you're doing, the outcome can be a lot greater. Mm -hmm. And then also, I'm on social media predominantly because of my brand, my yeah. business. It's not just like, hey guys, look at me. Now, I have created a, what I call a Finsta, where it's just a photo, what? a Finsta, it's a fan Instagram. Okay. Um, I created that, and that just recently happened, not too long ago, after being on, I've been on Instagram since, maybe like 10 years, mm -hmm. like 2000, 2009, 2010, Instagram, two, no, 2011. Probably since it dropped, I imagine. Yeah, like I pretty much had it that long. Yeah. So um, initially that's what I did. It was like, Frankie, like who, care, who cares about the salad you're eating? Um, <laughs> I, 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 like it's just, I didn't care about, I, it's like I saw myself following suit rather than saying, okay, why am I doing this? And then yeah. when I ask myself that question, I'm like, all right, I'm done with this goofy shit. I'm not doing that. I'm gonna focus more on what, can, what kind of substance can I bring? What type of influence can I create? How can I use this and monetize this and, and really create community? Like that's now my focus. And so ever since then, it's like, that's how my brand built. Like that's how followers increased. That's how the engagement increased because it was, 
less narcissistic and more how can I be of service, more value-based. Now I'm in a creative space, so obviously creatives value art and, and the creative things. So on my side, I had to, are we live? Are we doing we've the podcast? We've been live the whole time. Oh, we've been live the whole time. Our point. No, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know. <laughs> I think that's the longest it took for someone to ask that question. Oh, that's how you start them off? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I had no idea. Uh, are we allowed to cuss on here? Of course. Okay. Yeah, say whatever you want. Um, I don't edit anything. Okay. Yeah. It, okay. It's, it's the way it, the way we do it is the way it goes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I don't like anything curated. It's it's kind of what you're talking about. Right. Like you're we're kind of at a good point to talk about that. Like you're talking about art and beauty. I think the imperfections and the true realism of everything we're saying, my ums and my pauses and the time to think about something. I think there's a lack of that, and everything that people see is primarily curated and it's too perfect. I don't know if that's what people want. And right. I think that's why podcasts became so popular because it's like, here, we're just rolling. Right. We're rolling. It's a hang. Right. We're talking. It's not perfect, but you're also not listening actively necessarily as well. Right. You're in the background. You might be watching it. You may not be. It's the authenticity. That's right. That's the thing that um, people are afraid to be sometimes. And, and that's even why I started my podcast and even why I'm like, I definitely want to have you on because just the authenticity, the genuine, the genuineness in that engagement, that's what I appreciate, yeah. right? As a human and as human beings, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to create those authentic relationships. We're supposed to create genuine experiences with one another. Think about everything we do in life. It's never really about you, right? It's everything you do is related to a human being, to a person. You're, you're in real estate. You're connecting people with homes and, and, and real estate so that they can live and work and be and exist. Everything I do, when I look at it, it all involves people. And, and to take that understanding outside of your mind when you're doing things almost sabotages what could possibly happen when you recognize your talents aren't for you. They're for people. If you had talents and it wasn't for people, what is it for? Yeah. To stroke your own ego and be in the mirror and that's great. It, it created nothing. And so when I recognized, okay, Frankie, what, what, what are you naturally good at? What are your talents? What do you feel comfortable in? What, 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 what makes you feel great when you do something? In that space, that's your talent. That's your calling. That's your skill. Now use that for people, you know? and. For, for me, like that was one of the realizations where it's like, all right, I want to make sure everything that I do moving forward is with at least the understanding that this isn't for me, it's for people. And in return, I get what I want. Yeah. And that, that's the thing. When you bring that's really value. Well said. That, that's what it is. If you're putting the right thing out there and if you can get people to like what you're doing, you can kind of get them to do anything. I have a friend who posts all this kind of stuff. I'm like, so when are you going to come out with like your next pyramid scheme or when are you going to sell a course? When are you going to come like, he's just bringing followers in. But if you like his content, really whatever he comes out with, you might entertain. And right. You might buy that if you right. put it out there. A hundred percent because you, you, you've created trust. That's important. You know, um, back in the day, like way back in the day, um, in ancient times, when you called somebody a friend, it wasn't just loosely said. It wasn't like, oh, that's my friend. In those times, think about it, they had villages. It wasn't huge cities that were populated and people everywhere. So they had villages. And they used to literally do a ritual before you became my friend. The same way people get married and they have a whole wedding. It used to be where I'm going to cut my hand, you're going to cut your hand, and we're going to shake hands and we're going to have the exchange of blood. And what that did is created, created a covenant, created a promise that we are friends. So your pain is my pain. Your downs are my downs. My ups are your ups. We are now brothers. We are now family. We are now tied. We are friends. And so now in those villages, let's just say somebody wanted to come to attack you, they would put their hands up. Well, am I, what am I showing you? The scars on my hand. Is that where it comes from? Yeah. yeah. Scars on my hand. You're, you're not just messing with me. There's other people who are also responsible for my life and so you know understanding trust 
and, and creating that community is so important. And for me, like that's even what I try to focus on doing even with my team at Fabre Media is like, yeah, we're doing work. Yeah, we're doing projects, but I actually care about you. Like what's going on with you? What's going on in your mind? How was your day? How are you feeling? Where are you at right now? Because that affects everything, right? And so having like a podcast like this and allowing people to hear words, right? Because words are powerful. Words, it was literally you telling me, hey, let's go, come on a podcast and look where I'm at. It was words. Words altered my day. Words got me here. And so understanding that that exchange in what we do every day in life is going to create your reality. And for me, I've recognized that life is about people. So how can I serve them? How can I give somebody that good energy and, and what can I do for you? Or how can I be of service in terms of where can I put myself in your life that's going to help better your life? You know, and obviously you have people who, you know, you remove yourself from, but it's under the same understanding. It's where does this person hold weight in my life and do they bring any type of value? And where are we headed? Right, because life's about reciprocity. If it's not reciprocal, then this has no growth. And where there's no growth, things die. So I need to remove it, you know, so. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I take the same approach because and what you do and what I do are two totally different things. Right. At the end of the day, we're trying to help someone achieve a goal. Right. And if they feel comfortable, if you get to know them better, then you can help them achieve that goal with less friction. Right. And at the end of the day, anyone can help you buy a home, anyone can help you rent a place, but it's the trust and the community that we build within the process. I've heard a number of realtors talk like, you know, a client's a client. When I go home at night, I don't think about them. I'm never gonna have dinner with them. I'm never, like, the client is that. Right. I'm like, it's the exact opposite of my business. Like, every person I meet becomes part of something. Right. Always in contact, always wondering what's going on. And it would be so cold and a little uh, evil yeah. to do it any other way because it shows that you don't actually care. Right. And you're just putting the right foot forward to get the commission check at the end of the day or right. to get the payment at the end of the day and close that deal. And sales, so everyone, no one likes salesmen, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Everyone's afraid of that. No one wants to be taken advantage of. And to put trust in someone is a really big, important decision, no matter what you're doing. Right. If it's you and I working together, okay, we're gonna sign a contract, I'm gonna put you in charge of doing ads, or I'm gonna hire you to do it, and you're gonna do whatever you do in the background. But I'm, the person that's gonna hire you, they have so many different options. They have so many different ways to do it. And it's hard. Those decisions right. are really hard. I've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars doing the wrong decisions in different things. And why? Because you gotta test things. Like right. you don't know. You can go with your gut all you want, but sometimes you just have to take a leap, and see if it's gonna work. And with real estate, it's always funny because you're like, okay, but if I get one client from this, it'll pay for itself. But sometimes one client doesn't come and sometimes five clients come. Right. And just like you were saying, you can you repeat what you're already doing if that's what you're doing, if it works, but if it's not working, you gotta cut it. Right, 100%. Immediately. Yeah, and, and that's okay to do. Like some people feel like, okay, I started this, so this has to be that way. You have to allow innovation. You have to allow the ability to be flexible and know that if there's anything constant, it's change. It's the moment that you try to clog the pipe from flowing that you don't get what you want out of it. You have to release those things from saying, no, this is how it has to be. No, it doesn't all, oh, no, it doesn't. Cut. Like that, for me, it's, it's even like when I tell my team, whenever there's a problem, don't present me with the problem. Let's be solution-based. I clearly know there's a problem, but how are we gonna solve this? That's the conversation I want. That's the dialogue I want. And I wanna sit here talking about the problem all day. Who cares? It's not productive. That's gonna get us nowhere. Let's be solution-based. Or if an issue happens, it happened already. The, 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 the thing that occurred took place. We can't change that. How are we gonna move forward? And so, with people understanding even on, on, on the branding and marketing side of things, no matter what industry, it's like, okay, this already happened. Maybe it was a fail, a failure, or it didn't work as best as you thought it was gonna work out. That's fine. You don't stop. You stop doing that, you stop momentum. The moment you stop momentum, it's probably gonna mean that you're gonna lose the game. Yeah. You look at any sports team, whoever has the most momentum, most, most times is gonna win. And for me, it's figuring out that wave of momentum to ride or generating that wave of momentum to ride. 
that's the place where I win. And like even like with, with, with my agency, it's like I find myself in places where it's like, like how is this happening? And it's because I'm riding the momentum. I'm, when you're in momentum, it feels almost effortless, right? But recognizing that momentum and co consistently keeping that momentum is important. Now it may stop, and that's okay too. Storms come, momentum stops, but then now you have to operate in a different set of skills, such as discipline, right? Such as being able to persevere through that and then figuring out now when is that next wave coming. But you won't figure out if that next wave's coming if you stay stuck because that momentum died or you weren't willing to innovate or you weren't willing to pivot and change because you were so stuck in how you thought it was supposed to be because your idea just happened to be the best idea in the world. So there's no way that this wasn't able to work. That's, that's, that takes humbleness. That takes um, being able to be observant. And then you begin to shift. And then you're going to see those results that you want to see eventually. But people don't like eventually. They want instant gratification. And even to tie things back to what you said about um, keeping those relationships and, and, and doing that extra 120% versus just trying to make a sale, I can concur and say that even from our, our introduction of one another, you've, you've been that way. I mean, I've been in your home. I mean, every time I've been there, I've had food to eat. <laughs> like, like that's, that's a beautiful thing, right? right? And, and it's probably something that is natural to you. It's not something you have to think about. And we always want people to feel at home. We right. always want people to feel comfortable. And if you don't feel comfortable, you probably shouldn't. If you have found out enough times and there's just not that vibe, we're probably not gonna hang out again. Right. And it's just gonna fall away. You're not gonna reach out. It's like friends, right? The person you're always reaching out to, you just kind of stop reaching out to that person. You stop right. doing it. So that falls to the wayside, that friendship, dissolves it evaporates and that's fine because that's the way it should be right yeah no definitely and what the the beautiful thing about our conversation is it all correlates back to anything you do in life yeah. it doesn't matter friendships like, business everything. love building anything it, ha it has to have people involved yes and that's why these things are very interesting we're talking about how media changes and how fast media changes you don't even know it's changing it's because there's new people every day that are being born. Right. People are learning how to do things. They're thinking about things a little differently. And people are deciding how things go. Right. And I mean, look, look, at, look at the generation now. They were born into a new era of information. They were born with a tablet. right? In front Literally, of like, yeah. they came at out the of the tablet. Or they were born yeah. on a tablet. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's... And so to think that that doesn't have an effect on how somebody thinks is to be very blind and not recognize what's happening because you're so stuck in what you always were used to and what you what wanted. you want to continue but it isn't and I think we all deal with that like yeah. something somewhere something like you you want things that stay the same but they're not right and you, and you have to adapt it's like I remember when TikTok came out I was like okay well, like this is stupid I'm like well maybe I should open it up yeah maybe I should see what's going on here there's billions of people here now maybe I should look right and and that's the exact thing of understanding that whatever industry you're in it is going to be changed by the generation that's taking it over it is yeah. like how you do insurance now if you think you're still doing insurance the same way you were doing it in the early 2000s you probably are doing a bad job and you're probably not doing as great as you thought you would do unless you have had everything all the success and you've invested in different areas yeah. but it's different now that, that's the fear of every realtor because yeah. every realtor is waiting for the day when they're replaced like okay you can just go buy a home i think it's i used to think that it is coming and the more and more i live i'm actually like no i think it's further away because it is so complicated and there's people involved and there's trust involved and these two people have to trust each other but they can't so they need a professional to hold their hand along the way and make sure that they are protected and realtors often give this pitch of my job is to find properties for you when I start working with a client, one of the first things I say is, my job is not finding properties for you. You have a computer, you have a phone, you know what you want way better than I do. I might be able to do some research and talk to some people and find something that hasn't yet hit the market, but at the end of the day, I want you to find that. That's not my job. Right. That used to be. Right. Realtors used to hold the information and that would t they would tout that's all they did. Now my job is to protect you. I know that builder, 
I know how he builds. I know what materials he's using. I understand the structure of this building. I understand the neighborhood. I understand this little piece in the neighborhood, why this is more valuable than two blocks this way. Right. I understand all these elements and all these pieces of data that you're never gonna be able to glean from a spreadsheet. You're never gonna be able to go on Zillow, Redfin with all the data you're getting. And people are so analytical, they wanna believe that. They wanna sit there and look and think, I know everything. But at the end of the day, they come to us and they're like, make sure this works. Yeah, what's, what's gonna shift is, this, this is just an idea. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. Right now, what I see that's, that could potentially happen in the real estate space is it now become virtual reality. Oh, like metaverse? Yes, yeah. so now I'm putting a headset on and I'm meeting John. Yeah. And you're showing me literally around the entire home. Or so, so 10 years ago, you go to China, you wanna go look at a building, there's no person, you go to the front desk, they hand you an iPad, there's the person on the iPad walking you through the property. Little clumsy, but totally different system, totally different right. setup. Right. And I think that's very realistic. Yeah. Uh, here's the difference. And this is why you can't use a Zestimate to figure out the price of a property. This material is worth more than that material. These walls are different than this. People want to go in and they need that physical contact. They want to touch it. They want to see it. They want to smell it. When you walk into new construction, you smell it's new construction. It's like that new car smell. You're like, this is going to be mine. I'm going to be the first person to live here. Right. But I think you're right because people are already doing that with 3D floor plans. And when people That's exactly what I'm getting to. When, when people come to our listings, they've already watched our videos. Right. They've already done the 3D floor plan. They're basically there to do everything I just said, to right. smell it, to touch it, to make sure there's no problems, to really see if it's everything they thought it was. Right, and that could be that next layer. Like, yeah, eventually they're gonna wanna physically be in that space, but I'm, I'm just even with like the 3D, you know, uh, uh, cameras that they have that take pictures of the entire floor plan and put things together, the technology is 100% gonna advance, especially with the direction that we're going in as a society. But then they're gonna have equipment that's gonna be able to scan this entire floor. And I'm gonna be able to put a headset on and walk through it. You can do it now. Yeah? On the 3D floor plans, there, are, there is a VR option. The problem is no one has goggles. No one has the equipment yet, but that's gonna change soon. Right, exactly. And, and the question's gonna be, how are you going to appeal to the next buyer or renter who does have the headset? Are you gonna be so advanced in your technological setup just from the onset before they ever touch the building that they're gonna be like, this is where I wanna be because these are the things I use. Right. And you made it so easy for me that the building is gonna be a representation of that ease of use. Right. And so seeing it was easy without ever seeing it. And when people have Oculus or people have these different headsets, it's gonna become normal. Right, it's gonna become a normality. Yeah. And, and the question for people out there, especially in the real estate space is like, okay, are you setting yourself up for longevity? Mm -hmm. Maybe people who are just coming in now. Well, 10 years is gonna pass by guess what? That means your market is going to be people in a space that grew up with this. Yeah. So it's going to every 10 years. Right. So, so yes, like going, going back to, we know how you want it, but this is how it is. Yeah. And, and it's figuring out what, what, what foothold, what space, what shoe can I fit in, in this space, utilizing the reality, that this is the current influence in how things are operating. Yeah. Because unless you're a brand that's huge that can create that influence, like I said before, you have to take note of people or brands that create that influence. You kind of got to go through the back door. I like watching commercials just to see what's going on in the world. Love it. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not doing it because I, I, I want to watch it, but you need to. Right. You really want to see what's happening and how how people are marketing. How people market to people tells you everything about what's happening in the world. 100%. And you're right how, how things change. Every 10 years you introduce a new, a new pattern of habit, how we change and how we do things. I remember going to the store and buying software on a shelf and you right, own right. the software. Yep. And people are like, oh, this is, like, I own it and there, there's an update, there's an update. And then it became the monthly subscriptions. We have a client who does every, did every, he has over 100 units, has no software for it. And he has the old QuickBooks because he doesn't want to pay for the monthly version of QuickBooks. And he's just so stuck in his ways. He finally, after I think almost 10 years of working with him, used the service we told him to use. And it's made his life so much easier. Right. And he was just fighting it the entire time. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, yes, but what else are you going to do? He was, someone moved, they went to China or something and they weren't getting the rent payments. They're like, yeah, but you don't have an online portal. 
So you're expect like how do you expect me to get you the payments from right. here? You won't accept it. I tried to pay. You don't have a system. That's finally what pushed him over the edge because he lost like six months of rent and they weren't coming through. He's like, yeah, you have no online portal. This isn't on my on me. This is on you. Right. Like that's an interesting perspective. Right, and it's a reality. Like mm -hmm. it's it's real. Yeah. And this is in every industry, John. I'm like, at what point are you going to recognize that you have to be willing? to change and be a part of that growth. And rather than fight it, how about you spearhead it? How about you recognize it? Yeah. And how and figure out how can I not be on the back end of this, but be on the front end? People are afraid of backing a loser. They want it pushed and validated enough so then they can jump on it. Right. But to be on the forefront of something, they risk embarrassment. Right. And that's where it all comes. It all comes from fear. It's like 100%. There, there's been a number of uh, blockchain solutions that people have tried to introduce in the real estate because I don't think the, the world's there yet. Right. And it's such an old process. It's like banking, okay? We could just started depositing checks with five or six years ago. The technologies have been around forever. Right. And it takes so slow to move. But as soon as things are happening and as soon as it's ubiquitous and as soon as it's proven, now everyone wants to jump on it. But the companies that were first doing it, well, they captured all the audience. Right. They were on the forefront of everything. And that's, it's like even what I'm doing in my business, like anyone can grab a cell phone and record themselves. They can have their wife or their spouse, whoever, record them walking through a property and do it if they're good at that. But they don't do it. Why? They are afraid of looking stupid. Right. I, I don't care about looking stupid. I think it's funny. You want to laugh at me? Great. I just made you laugh. All right. Entertainment. Fantastic. I did my job. Yeah. No, and, th and that's true. People just don't do it because of fear. Fear paralyzes them yeah. because they're so concerned with what somebody thinks. If you want to be a real cent a trendsetter, if you want to be a person who is riding that momentum, you have to be willing to fall. You have to be willing to be laughed at. But most importantly, you got to get out of yourself. This is get out of yourself. This isn't you're so self centered to the point where you're sabotaging your own growth. Yeah. And man, that, that's one of the things that I truly am grateful for that I've come to terms with is, you know, a lot of times people are like, damn, Frankie, like you do so much, like you work so hard. Like, how are you doing all these podcasts and running an agency and then working on some other projects and then do, because why, why, why not? Like, what, what am I afraid of? Well, what am I going to lose well, here? Well, what are you doing too at the time? I mean, like the other person. People fill their time with a lot of nonsense. 100%. They, they tell themselves, yeah, I'm busy and this. Most people aren't busy. They're not as busy as they say. No. And you have 24 hours in a day. You probably were active four hours of that day. And, you know, I, I get a kick sometimes out of when people are like, and they tell me, man, Frankie, you need balance. I'm like, yo, I'm balanced. Like, like. I'm balancing on the beam. Right. Like, you, people project their, their ideologies. Um, on you so much so it's because they're threatened right and or they just believe that it's the way yeah they just are so committed that this is the way not recognizing but it's, it's the threat because they think it's the way because if you said it isn't that threatens their identity right and then that scares them 100%. and then we get yeah. back to the fear thing yeah no doubt that's very true and that's what life is it's just a bunch of human beings projecting their reality to one another and that also ties in back to branding. What is marketing? It's a projection. And the idea is the brand that's able to create more humans to project the same idea wins. It's like Apple. Think about the commonality in the conversations. You know how many, we were just talking about the iPhone 13 and how great it is. How many people had that same conversation? Yeah. We are all convinced and believe and we have the projection. We're projecting that this is a reality. That's what marketing is, branding is. That's why it's so important to recognize what it is you are projecting, because that is show what you've been influenced by. What it is that you're projecting, because that is show what you believe. What it is that you're projecting, because that is show you what your fears are and it'll show you the true reality of what's happening inside of you, rather than just living day to day without being conscious of the moment. And people who go into marketing and in branding they have to be conscious of the moment. It's, it's almost a part of what is necessary to create great marketing. You have to, all right, what's happening now? 
not yesterday and not tomorrow. What is happening now? Okay, now let's create. And then from that can stem, well, what do we want to influence for the future? But it all starts with what's happening now. And recognizing that is life changing. In branding, in my personal life, in your personal life, it changes things completely. Apple's a great example. Apple's amazing because what they've done is create a safe space for people of trust. We were talking about the ads and the cookies and everything. So Apple right now, you know, all the big software companies, they have bounties for any bugs or anything in their software. They have two huge bugs that have been brought out to the public that they haven't paid the bounty hunters for and still haven't been patched. They haven't been patched because it bypasses everything you just said earlier. So you're, they're still able to collect data, but it's, no one's really talking about it, but it is on some message boards and depending on where you're looking. But Apple represents this safe space because everyone thinks it's the best product. And really what it is, they created a blue dot and a green dot. And with that, it's not just the best device, but now I'm in inclusive, I have this space. Samsung has all the features iPhone had like a year or two in advance usually, but iPhone's iPhone. And I'm an Apple person. And you better believe I am not gonna be caught dead with a Samsung. Adam's got a Samsung. But, and I used to. Did, you ever, did I ever tell you the story about FaceTime? No. I got an iPhone because, I, during the pandemic, I had to because clients would wanna see the property, wanna to talk to me right now, and there was too much friction in them going and doing it a different way other than FaceTime. Right. I, had, I could see frustration on one client, and it was building. They're a little older. They were in their 50s. Yeah. And I was like, okay. I went and got an iPhone that night. I hit them up the next day. They're like, oh, this is great. They were so happy. <laughs> right. And I told them, like, I did this for you. I mean, what else do you have to tell someone to make them happy, right? But it's really that thing. Apple creates this safe space knowing I'm on top of it. I'm, I'm trend setting. I have my iMessenger, I'm, I'm just like everyone else. And it's, it's very interesting. It's, I love Apple products, but you know there's a better one at all times, but you're still gonna have the iPhone. And now that I have one, I'm never going back. Right, once you go Mac, you never go back. But I've had a Mac forever. That's the funny thing. I just know the phones are better. Yeah. Everyone puts out a better phone than Apple, but the Apple has the best interface, it has the best user experience, and it's, it's just easy. Yeah, I mean, Apple, I, I, even down to like, like you were saying, green bubble, blue bubble. Like I can't stand being in a group chat. No one can. With somebody who has green, cause you defeat all of the capabilities. Like, like if, if everybody in there has iPhone, you could do multiple FaceTimes where if there's six people in there, everybody could be on FaceTime. Yeah. But if there's somebody that has an Android that's in there, can't happen, right? The features that you can get with like, creating like the names and the pictures of the actual group chat and doing all those different things. You can't do that with Android. Or if it's an Android and you know, you can click the, the message and you could ha ha it or yeah. heart it. It looks so bad on an iPhone. Right, no, it, 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 it'll say, oh, Frankie ha ha the message. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like just that part of it. But Apple now, which I'm very excited about because they're M1 chips. Um, and then obviously with their new, uh, the new computers are raw. Have you seen them? hundred yeah. percent. Like it's, it feels different. And, and also for me being a creative, right? I'm in, you know, the video space editing. I need a, a high CPU, high GPU. Um, those are important. It allows it's, it's the indifference of saving me 30 hours a month or not. Yeah. 30 hours a month for me is a lot of money. Yeah. So I, it's about time cost ratio. So if I know that utilizing a particular product's gonna allow more efficiency and allow a better workflow, then that's gonna be and the reliability. Winner. And it's all about reliability. Yeah. That's so one like, of the reasons I use Apple computers. Yeah. And like, I know this is gonna work every time. I never have a problem. It's gonna open up and here, bam. It's right, like, it's I, super smooth. I switched because I was in college and I had a PC, had PCs forever. My roommate had a Mac. I was like, that's cool, that's nice, whatever, it's shiny. And then I didn't open up the computer for like a month. I opened up the computer, wouldn't start. Yeah. I was like, what the hell is this? Yeah, and unless you're putting like, I mean, don't, don't you know, obviously for anybody out there who has PC, clearly like you can create a, a look, wonderful. Look at a Surface. Surface dominated that market because the Surface is an awesome product. It's more business friendly, completely different price point. At the end of the day, iPads only exist because Apple wants to have two different products. Like, we should have touch screens on our computers, let's be real. But they want to sell iPads. 
what's an iPad? iPad's like a TV, a portable TV. It's a very expensive or portable it's a big television. Phone. It's a big phone. <laughs> right. Like no one you I've never met one person that really uses the iPad well. I know they exist and I know probably, probably designers draw people that are using it in that fashion. Right, exactly. I see and, that. And, and and that's that's where it comes to um, your user base. Mm -hmm. An iPad is very essential, especially if you have like, you know, the 13 inch iPad and you might be a drawer, um, somebody who, who does design. That's your paper. That's it, cool. It's, it's, it's amazing. It yeah. does great. Like I, I would, I couldn't see myself doing that on my laptop. Like it just, yeah. unless it folds like a surface or something like that. But with, you know, if you put some dollars into creating a PC, it can be really fast. But outside of that, as of recently, um, uh, Apple is no longer in their contract with Intel because we used to have the Intel chips. Yep. So now they got their own chips, the M1 chip. So they came out with their first version of the M1 chip and now they have M1 chips that are, are amazingly fast now with the M1 chip Pro. Um, and those chips, the, the cool thing about it is it's tied to the CPU and the GPU. Unlike with like Intel, those are things you add. This is built around that. Everything was bolted together before and it's all plug and play everything in the new Macs are made to work together. Right, so it's just so much more seamless. Um, so yeah, when it comes to that, we're talking about it and having that discussion because of their brand yeah. and how they brand it. <laughs> like literally, we had a whole segment about Apple and, and that's proof enough to show what, if you're in this space of marketing and advertising, which some people don't recognize it, but even if you're not a marketer, you're a marketer. Yeah. You are a brand. Everything you do is a story being told about you and whoever you're around is the image you're portraying for them to then receive that and for them to think of you in that way. You're marketing every day. Every single time you go out, it's like, oh, you gotta go watch this movie. This movie was amazing. This is da da da. Well, they weren't paid to tell you that. And if I think you have whack opinions, and if you like, we don't agree on movies. I'm not going to listen to yours at all. Right. It's like, a, that's the branding, right? Like, what's that person's part. brand? Do I appreciate these opinions on this matter? If I don't, I'm dead. I'm just going to stop listening. Right. All the way. So, uh, yeah. T tell me, uh, tell me some things about um, uh, just in Chicago, the real estate market. I'm curious. No, we're here for you. You're here for me. Yeah. Okay. So, how'd you get started doing this? Um. What exactly? The whole beginning. I mean, you're working for yourself, but you have a media company. How did you fall into that space? Yeah, so, um, well, when I was 15, I got into computer space. So when I was 15, I learned, I learned, you know, like some HTML, you know, just different like coding, uh, tapped into a little JavaScript, stuff like that. But I got into kind of like that space. I've always been a creative, but it was just something that interested me, just website building. And then I got a job um, at a computer store where I learned how to build computers, okay. PCs. Actually, the guy who owned it, he called Macintosh. Uh, uh, he was like, <laughs> Mac and shit. <laughs> that, that, was, that was his word. Well, the original Macs were notorious for having different hardware. You couldn't even open them. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make sure people couldn't do anything. And then a lot, what a lot of people didn't even know, if you o did open it on the inside of the module, on the plastic back, was the signatures of every person that worked on that project pretty cool that's pretty cool actually yeah. but you know even with that so at that time we were we were kind of leaving off floppy disk you remember floppy disk yeah like you would install software through cds and floppy disk and stuff like that it's so, a three and a half inch and they had the zips right and yeah. like yeah exactly I mean, like the big mm -hmm. ones um so that was just the introduction to the side of like the technology side of things right um and then understanding like web development and flow and, and people's engagement with something you create. Um, and then when I was 16, I got into photography. And at that point, I actually, my first, this is when I had an Android, I had the Evo, it was like one of the first 4K uh, smartphones. And you know, I did like a photo shoot with my camera, with my phone camera, uh, with my girlfriend at the time. And I remember taking these pictures. I was like, man, this is so good. This is now when I look back at it, it's super trash. Yeah. But I'm for like, the time, though, right? I but it like, was great. This is great. Like, I don't know, 13 megapixels. Um, and yeah, uh, that 12 doesn't even have 13 megapixels. Right. After a certain amount of <laughs> megapixels, you don't even need you don't even need that. But I was like, man, I caught a moment 
And I said to myself, I like this. I really like this. This is cool. Like I just captured a moment that will last forever. Um, and at 19, so time passed, you know, I was, I was just a phone guy. I didn't have a camera yet. And at 19, um, well, during that time as well, I did music. So, you know, I, I'm a musician. Um, also, like, was like an artist. I was into hip hop and stuff like that. So I would make music. And at the time, I had moved to Chicago. I mean, moved out of Chicago, moved to uh, Florida. I was in Florida. Um, I went to out in Tampa, and I wanted to shoot a music video, and I couldn't afford it. You know, the people I was around were charging thousands of dollars. I couldn't afford that, so. I bought like a $300 camera, a Canon T3. And um, the purpose and the intent, uh, intent of that was to shoot my own videos with friends and shoot videos for friends and stuff like that. So then I bought my camera and you know, I started taking photos with it. I thought I was the man, you know, I was taking photos with it, doing you know, videos as best as I could, studied the software, um, initially went into iMovie, um, and just kind of got into that creative space of creating content for myself. And then eventually what ended up happening was a business was like, hey, can you um, do a website for us? I'm like, sure. They're like, I see you do video. Can you do a video for us? I'm like, I'm like, sure. They're like, and we need some photos. I'm like, okay. They're like, how much would you charge us? And I'm like, uh, is that the hardest question? Right, you're starting something right. I'm like, I have no idea. I'm like, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> call every competitor that works in this area. Yeah. Right, I'm just like literally looking, right? Cold calling, hey, so what would you charge? <laughs> like, I, 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 didn't know, I didn't know what to do. You didn't even have a baseline. Right. You're like, what, 1,000, 10,000? I charged $300. Oh, wow, okay. That's how like yeah. out of the loop I was and didn't recognize, plus, which, you know, it is what it is. I was just like new in it. So I did a website, a video, a photo, $300. And then three hundred hours too. Right, right. <laughs> three hundred dollars for three hundred hours, <laughs> legit, right? And then, hey, we need revisions. We need this. That's when I was introduced to like, what the hell are we doing here? Yeah. Um, and that was like the origin of me getting into branding for businesses. Um, and then from that point, it just became they became a client. I started to do more, and I recognized maybe I need to charge a little bit more um, to make it make sense. And then I just started expanding and, and doing things for, you know, uh, friends who had businesses or family members or this person said that you would be good to do this. And it was very low. And I mean, obviously, I wasn't amazing yet um, as much as we are now. But Did you just call yourself amazing. Yes, 100 percent. Because if, if, if I'm not going to do it, who else will? Um, so. Just in that space, I just began to just grow and learn. And so I started my first company, my first agency. Um, and that was that first agency, and I'd rather not say the name, but that first agency um, was, was my school. That's what I like to call it. Like all the money I lost was my tuition, Yeah. right? Um, when I tell you I worked day in, day out, hours after hours after hours, go to sleep at three, wake up at seven, hours, hours, studying, taking classes online, you being a uh, user of my craft, talking to people, man, a guerrilla marketing like crazy, printing out a thousand flyers, going car to car, knocking on doors. I was hustling. I was, this is eat, breathe, this is all I did. Um, and I just started to grow it and grow it and grow it. And at that time, all I had was like $300 to my name and you know, I turned $300 into six figures. Um, but at that time, I was so financially illiterate because I started my first company uh, when I was 21. Um, so a few years after 19, because then I started to realize this was something I could do. And you know, through my, through my lack of financial literacy, um, you know, when I first seen like $10,000 come in, you know, I'm like, wow, this is great. You know, bought a Mercedes, you know, <laughs> got like a super nice loft. Um, and then when I see something come in the second month, I'm like, oh, 13,000, I've never made that much in my life. Got a $3,000 dog and <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I was just um, very um, immature in, in my understanding of money. 
Nobody put me on, nobody taught me. Nobody was able to, there was no guidance, something that I wish I had, there was no mentor. When, when you get money, everyone has stupid purchases. I, I always equate it to suits and clothing or even dry cleaning. Uh, I'm like, okay, so I remember when I started doing this, I would drive you know, 15 minutes away to go to the discount dry cleaner and it, it comes back whenever it is, but it's the cheapest price possible. And then you get a little older and you're like, okay, so now I'm gonna, there's a place in my building but they're a little expensive. I'm gonna go across the street and go and go do that. You, if you live at Trump, Trump will get your dry cleaning and put it inside your closet for you, okay? But there's all these different levels of things and you don't know until you really try and eventually like, you're like I'm, doing, I'm going to do the most convenient thing possible because I don't wanna spend the 30 minutes it's gonna to take to cross the street and go over there or deal with that right. person, do that thing. And purchases are the same way. It's like you have to spend some money to realize how stupid spending that money was. Like, okay, did you go get rims for your car? And like two years later, you're probably like, oh, that was stupid. Right. Right? You right. have to have that humility in the process. And you, you have to like make fun of yourself when right. you're doing it. Right. And then, and then really <laughs> recognizing it because what can happen is it can become a pattern um, and a subconscious thing. And you begin to self-sabotage yourself. Even when you know it, you just are acting on, on, on a set of habits that you've developed. And for me... You know, what, what ended up happening is, man, I remember I had the loft, the business, the car, and then at one point, $12 in my pocket. And it was tough. Yeah. It, I was just like. And rent's due. Man, and literally and rent's due. due. And then the rent for the office, like the studio. And I'm just sitting in my car like, damn. So you were sprinting when you should have been walking. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, not recognizing it. And the, and the thing is, I didn't know that droughts happen. I'm thinking this is just gonna come in, come in, come in, come in. And plus my business model was terrible. Yeah. It wasn't like I had a business, no model. business model. Damn near no business yeah. model. And you know, it was one of those things where I didn't set myself up for success. It's about positioning. And I didn't position myself for that. I fell into something through my hard work. I worked my ass off, but it's not about what you can get, but what you can keep. And not necessarily what you can keep, but then also how you use what you keep to then create more. Like somebody once told me, he's like, Frankie, you need to send your dollars our soldiers. You need to send your soldiers out to recruit more. And I didn't understand that. You know, I say I, that all the time. It's important. Yeah. I, I, I didn't understand that. It comes that. from the, I think it's the tale of Gilgamesh. There, there's a book that says that. And in the book, they actually call them slaves. They're like, your dollars are slaves and they work for you. And they have to be out working for you all the time. And it's a very good book about money that isn't about money, but it is. Right. It's, I'll throw it up here, but it's, it's really good. And it's, it's true. Like your money has to be working for you. And when you're right. using it, you got to burn the churn and all those things work. Right. And, and if there's one thing that I, I would highly Babylon, recommend. Babylon, The Richest Man in Babylon. That's the name of the book. Oh yeah, I've read that book. That's yes, what it's The from. Richest Man in Babylon. That's what yeah, it's from. Yeah, how he, he started off like with nothing. Yeah. And you know. It's a great book. He, he, he made some wealth, but then he made his mistakes, but then he made some wealth and then he put a particular amount aside. And then he, did, he kept doing that every single month, every single month, every single month, every single year. And then took this amount of money and then put it into something that was able to do even more. Yeah. So forth and so on, became The Richest Man in Babylon. I've read that book actually. Um, but if there's one thing that you know, I would want people to definitely pick up is understanding to, be, to become financial literate because that was the game changer for me is now going into that space, here I am. You know, from the outside, it looks like I got all these great things and, and all this stuff and here I am sitting in a parking lot in a Mercedes with $12 in my pocket not knowing what the hell I'm gonna do. You know, um, and I put myself there. That was me, nobody else, right? I, I had to take accountability for that at that moment and recognize, all right, cool. And, uh, but yeah, long story short, um, you know, <laughs> clearly I made it out. And, um, uh, you know, obviously I, I did certain things that I had to do, hustled even harder, connected with certain people um, had to do some OPM, which was important to get out of situations, um, that particular situation, other people's money, um, and recognize where I was wrong, what issues I created, what type of habits I developed, and what, did I, what I needed to do so that way next time around I wouldn't do this. And so um, I stopped my business actually, that first agency, 
and uh, for about almost a year and went back to the drawing board. Went back to the drawing board, um, made a little bit of extra cash in the meantime, did some freelance work here and there to kind of sustain some stuff. But went back to the drawing board and I'm like, how am I doing this next time? I didn't just give up and stop and say, this isn't for me. That, no, I'm like, I messed up. Because then you would be, then that would be like a sunk cost. Instead, you turn it into an investment. 100%. That was my tuition is what I tell people. If I would have gave up and not done what I did, we wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. This is a result of all those actions that took place prior to this moment. And it was recognizing in that moment that I had to take accountability, go back to the drawing board, figure out what I needed to do, become resourceful, figure out what next steps I had to make. And I did that and, and started from ground zero in terms of the business, which is now Five Ray Media. Um, but what I didn't start from ground zero with is my understanding, the wisdom that I got, the knowledge that I gained, and the understanding that I knew was needed to get to the next level. And man, from that point, and obviously you know, I'm still learning, still growing. I think the thing about it is systems are always needing to be changed, and so that occurs. But now I'm in a space where through those mistakes, I recognize way ahead what something's looking like and what direction I'm moving in because I never want to be there ever, ever again. Yeah. Never, ever, ever again will I ever want to be there. And, you know, that's a motivator for me. Um, another motivator for me is death. You know, a lot of people don't like to talk about it. I bring it up many times, you know, and it's that tomorrow's not promised for me nor for you. And so, yeah, statistically, I probably might live through the day and based upon my life, I'll probably continue, God willing, but there is no promise. And so, and, and I'm not afraid of that. But what I am conscious of is that is a reality. And because of that, I need to do what I'm doing now. And there is no ands, ifs, or buts about it. Because if I can't give my all today, then I'm hindering who I possibly can become because no, I don't have tomorrow. As much as I wanna believe that, now obviously I can't do everything in a day, but just recognizing that tomorrow may not be promised means that I need to be as efficient and as productive, even if it's just one thing today that's gonna to move me into the right direction. Even if it's just one person I can impact that's gonna help them out. Just something, being conscious of that changed my life completely. Well, the only way to make sure you're ahead tomorrow is to make sure you're not behind today. And so you have to build on every single day. And it's like, it's, it's easy. It's easy to take a day off. It's easy to relax. It's easy to hang out. <clears throat> but then you ask yourself, okay, but what am I doing? Right. You, you own this company. If you don't do it, no one else is going to do it for you. It's not going to be luck of the draw that something comes along your way. It could be. It absolutely could be. But it's really not luck. It's all the preparation and all the things that you've done before exactly. that to move it forward for that meeting to happen, exactly. for that time to come. Yeah, I mean, that happened to me yesterday, actually. Um, uh, a gentleman that I met maybe like two years ago, almost three years ago, two, two years ago, through another friend. Um, him, I, w I went to the gym yesterday, and, and I hadn't seen him for probably like seven months. He comes in, I notice him, he noticed me. I'm like, you know, what's up, what's up? I get, I get back to working out. And before I decided to leave, you know, I wanted to show love. So, cause that's what you do. So I walked up, I'm like, hey man, how you been, et cetera. You know, we had a conversation. He looked at me, he goes, oh, you're the guy. It's you. I'm like, what? He's like, we need you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, we're doing this huge architectural project. Right now we got about four, six, four to six million dollars into this project and we need video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, working with budgets around twenty to forty thousand dollars. He goes, This is my business partner right here. Um, give her your number and uh, we're gonna talk next week. There's about seven people involved and um, we've had actually have had discussions and it's you who we want to hire to do that. So we just need to have a meeting and figure that out. That conversation 
Always go to the gym. That's all, that's all I heard. <laughs> always go. To, moral of the story, always go to the gym. But to concur on what you're saying is that didn't just happen by luck. Yeah. That happened because your name precedes you through everything that you've done prior to that moment. Yeah. And understanding that back to the brain and who you are, that's what it's about. I made an impact in somebody's life. It was genuine, it was, it, it was authentic, 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 and now they referred me to that person. That didn't just happen, and then that happened, that relationship happened because of my agency presenting it to them and creating that dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's a cause and effect. There's, there's, there's no such thing as something for nothing. It all has to have some, a harvest doesn't come without seeds being sowed. You know what I mean? Um, and so recognizing like that that moment happened, which happens to me often, you know, thank God, happens to me very often. And it's projects like that all the time. And so that, you know, sometimes I sit down and I ask myself like, how is this happening? Like, like how is this really happening? And it's because of the impact that I make in people's life, every opportunity I get, that's, that is my ROI because I put people first because, I, because I'm gonna really sit there and I really wanna hear what you have to say. I really wanna talk to you and I wanna figure out how can I make you better or how you can make me better before we actually leave. What's really happening? And the more I have those relationships and engagements with people, the more I recognize how better my life becomes rather than it's like, doing somebody dirty or half-assing some stuff or all these things, you're literally just creating a toxic environment. And really that environment is just a toxic community because you have a community somehow. Now the question is, is your, is your community thriving, the one you created in the world you live in, or is it toxic and is it bringing you down? Because all of that is predicated on you. All of that is a result of your actions and your choices. And me, I choose to put out what I want back. And I'm quick to position people where they need to be placed as well, respectfully. You know, if you're not supposed to be in my life in that place, it would be very, very quick to happen. You know, because I understand what I am giving is what I also feel I need. And not necessarily that person giving me the exact same thing, but do they make that easy to happen, right? Because not everybody is, is like you, which is something I've learned real quick. Right? You can't have expectations. The only thing I expect are those expectations from me. I have no expectations for John. I have no expectations for Taylor. My expectations are of myself. And as long as I keep myself accountable to that, nobody can alter that for me. Which means that the results I'm gonna get can be consistent over time. Because I'm not being swayed left and right because that expectation I put on that person didn't happen so now I'm hurt or now I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. You're not gonna disappoint me. I don't have no expectations for you. I expect that your expectations for yourself are of standards and of the value system that is similar to mine. Therefore, I don't need expectations because we're, we're, That's we're why meshing. We're here. That's why we're here. Yeah. You know, so it just comes in that place of self-awareness and, and realizing who I am because then everything is gonna exude from that place of understanding. Media is really good because there's no half-assing it. There is, but you <laughs> right, can see right, it. Right, you can see like it. It's, it's clear as day. If, <laughs> right. you're, if you're running an ad campaign, you're gonna know on the results. If I'm looking at the video, I'm gonna be able to tell. And it's, it's kind of beauty to have the beauty because you know what's going into it or what's not going into it. And there's different style. There's you know a little rougher around the edges, things are a little more natural, more candid. Right, UGC stuff. What's UGC? Uh, user generated content. Okay. Yeah. yeah, like more like my phone, yeah. right? Yeah. Versus a I, higher production. I mean, you have people sitting there in a living room with an iPhone making million dollars a year doing TikToks. Right. That's a real world now. It's a real thing. And for a lot of people, that's better. That's what they prefer. They want this raw, real, quick content that people can really absorb. Or maybe you want to sit and watch a movie. They're two totally different art forms, different audiences, or maybe the same audience, but different purposes. Right. And you're going to absorb it and you're going to you're gonna get it differently. Right, and a thought came to me, and the question is, is John ready 
to be a real estate in the virtual world because, <laughs> because people are going to literally buy homes in virtual worlds yeah like with real money nfts they're, and they're, they're going to buy real estate in some type of metaverse right and think uh, it will not be facebook's and it'll be whatever world we all decide to live in and there'll be different metaverses and different lands and that's what people don't understand about nfts you're like okay so yeah i can right click and take it that has nothing to do with any of this the idea of the nft is okay if this has the authentic real version in this clubhouse that we're all hanging in, you think the cool kids are going to be here or they're going to be in the room with the fakes, right. with the right clicked versions. Right. Cool kids are going to be there. People are going to want to be there. And even more so, the NFT is given opportunity for people to be, to relate to their, to the artist. The artist has an ability to connect with the user in a way that was never possible before. Tarantino's dropping, I think, seven NFTs of scenes that no one's ever seen from Pulp Fiction. Oh, nice. Like, what are those gonna go for? Right. And if you love Pulp Fiction, or if you're a huge Quentin Tarantino fan, you better believe you're gonna want that, because I don't know if it's now, or 20 years, or 50 years, or whatever, but you're gonna have your digital world, you're gonna put on your goggles, or you're gonna plug in like the Matrix, right. and we're, we're gonna be there. You're right. gonna have this house, and those are gonna be the scenes. They're gonna be up on your wall. Right. Or they're gonna be new digital bling. You're gonna be out, and you, you know, see these NFTs? It's gonna be the portfolio. It's like literally the portfolio. It's yeah. about status. Yeah, it's like status. It's, it's, it's a literally, status thing. And it's, to ignore that right. means you're ignoring how the world works. Everyone cares about status on some level or yeah. another. Yeah. People are gonna display it differently. They're gonna talk about it in, in different ways, but everyone wants status in the little cliques or societies, places they are. Yeah. And they want to be the baller in their spot. And the NFTs are going to become the digital way of doing that. People are going to be able to legit make real money in virtual worlds. It's amazing. Um, it's kind of scary that that will be a reality very soon because... We're, and we were talking about the different generations. Mm -hmm. Like if someone wakes up and they had a screen their entire life, that kid that's five years old right now, when he's 20, he's like, why do I need this screen mm -hmm. still? Why do I have these clunky goggles on? Can I just go over there? Right. And it reminds me of Inception, where they have, there's like a, an Asian dude and he's like hooking everyone up and they're all going to their other world. And he's like, who are you to judge or what's right or wrong? Like, that's what that is. Those people are in the metaverse, right? right. They're escaping this world because it's not the best world for them. And they want to go to this place where it's better. Right. And people are going to do that. And people are going to sell real estate in there. Yeah. Because you can own a, a particular building. Yeah that is a NFT or one of a kind, or just a particular place in a particular metaverse and sell it for crypto. Yeah. And then exchange that crypto for actual USD or- it, it, It's gonna be crazy to see what happens. I, I'm just thinking about like, people are gonna live, like really live two lives. Yeah. This is gonna be wild, man. Yeah. And I think the hardest part of that is, I, how do you think someone would make money in a, in a metaverse. The same way you make money here. But doing what? By marketing. By marketing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna have to start my agency in the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, want the best metaverse uh, restaurant? <laughs> we have you. Listen, tune in, Fabre Media, metaverse marketing starting today. <laughs> this is the day that it was mentioned. Stay tuned. Yes. Want to cut on that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Let's do it. It's a good place then. All right. Okay. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, definitely.